for the second. Thank you so much for the introdu introduction there, Willem. Um, so yeah, if we're, we're both really thrilled to be with you today and we're going to have a conversation on connecting the opens. Um, and so when we were thinking about the session, uh, I thought, well, maybe we could just start off by saying what open uh, means to us or what is open and then just show you an image that perhaps uh, um, says a little bit more about uh, uh, what we feel about open. Um, so I'm going to invite Catherine to show her image first. I haven't seen it yet. So this is kind of a conversation <laughs> starter for us. <laughs> can you share your screen? Yeah, I'm trying. Let's see if it can go and share now. Let's see. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes. And this is a, this is a picture I took about maybe four or five weeks ago on the top of a mountain in the Highlands of Scotland. And to me, open is both clearly a virtual thing but also clearly a physical thing and so to me it's mountains it's space it's freedom and this is also a national park part of this so it's also about public interest public spaces so that's what i wanted to share okay thanks very much so uh can i share my yeah, yes, stop sharing now so there you go mine. vanessa just a second So, uh, yeah, so for me, actually, let me tell you about a dream that I had a few years ago. I had an amazing dream where I was at the top of a skyscraper, the 123rd floor, if that even exists, I don't think it does, but I was at the very top of a really high skyscraper and I could see over the whole world. So I could see the Saharan Desert, I could see Sydney, uh, I could see the Amazon. It was just amazing and all of the colours. And for me, if I look at open and what I want open to be, it's looking at this, a really diverse landscape, a thriving landscape. So here, this is the best I could do because obviously that dream, you can't capture it in a photograph. But here you see water, you see woods, you've got a uh, town in the background, you've got farming going on. Um, so there's a real ecosystem here of open. So that means open access to publications, to research data, to fair data, but it's also open education, those worlds coming together. It's we're all part of one world, but there are different pockets of that. And it's, we all need oxygen, we all need water. How do we care for open? And how do we also collaborate more effectively to resolve some of the common issues that we all have yeah because we know that if we don't also look after the planet and look after open um you know all the work that we've been doing uh, uh, for that might be co-opted by the large commercial companies um so uh, so for me this is kind of the vision where things are really working well and, and you have a world that's really thriving. I don't think we're there yet. And also I think uh, interoperability is also really important between the opens. Uh, so technical interoperability so that everything really does work well together. Yeah. Um, so I think um, that's why I, I, I um, that's why I really like this image. Um, what I also really love about open is that it's a real enabler yeah, for so many. So Catherine, you were talking about freedom. Um, so for me, it's also really about empowering uh, others and to enable progress and uh, growth and innovation. That's so key. And it also enables society to get engaged with what we're doing, be it um, research, uh, research on COVID, for example, uh, right now, or um, or uh, uh, in education when you're stuck at home, and that you can in, you can learn and grow uh, and engage with others uh, uh, online. Um, so I'm really hoping that open will really be uh, the norm, and there are some really strong signs in Europe that open, at least open research, so access to 
research publications that pub that's publicly funded and fair data that that's increasingly becoming uh, the norm the modus operandi for learning uh, uh, and research that's what we're looking uh, towards really um, so yeah uh, that's why I, I really love my job because it's all about open and making progress uh, with that so um, I think it would be quite nice to know in the audience what others, uh, what, what does open mean to you in the chat? Perhaps you can tell us. I'm sh let me just unshare my screen. So what does open mean to you? Willem and Igor, Igor can also join in. Or are you just like waking up and having a coffee and... Just a word will do. No? Yes. Right, the opposite of open is broken. Well, you know, open is is there to, it's been introduced because of a broken publishing system we've had and also to limited access to education, yeah? So we're actually trying to um, mend the broken with open, aren't we? Access to resources, yes. Hard to wake up indeed. Oh, that's nice. Could you like the pictures? Invitation to explore in the open. Yes, inclusivity, indeed. Enabled permission, affordable access. Nice. Yeah, opens a way to have a better society, indeed. Oh, morning, Santiago. Yes, accelerates innovation, indeed, yes. Great, we've got some lovely thoughts there. Don't want to force you wake, wake, waking up. <laughs> um, so what we're also going to do uh, uh, to, get, to get us started is also to share, coincidentally, we're both working on our new strategies, yeah? So you're going to have a bit of a sneak peek on what Spark Europe uh, is planning on doing in the next four years and also what Creative Commons is planning on doing. I'm really super interested to hear uh, from Catherine because we haven't actually shared all of this uh, in advance. So I'm going to pass, Catherine, are you OK with uh, talking about your uh, strategy first? Sure, sure. So um, I know Vanessa put some slides. I'm, I'm just going to talk. Um, so um, I've come in um, on the 17th of August and it's really marking, as I say, almost 100 days or if 100 days today. Um, and what we've been doing is a very in-depth um, consultation pro process, listening process with both our stakeholders, our community, our funders, our board, our, you know, it just a plethora of, of individuals, organisations to really try and think about us in terms of the next five years. For many of you, you'll know that Creative Commons is an international not-for-profit helping to build a, and sustain a thriving commons of shared knowledge and culture. And when we've been looking at those photographs of the open spaces and of the, the physical commons that is, is, is for us all, it's just really interesting that uh, we are about a thriving commons. So together, you know, we have an extensive network and multiple partners and we build capacity to develop solutions and advocate for open sharing of knowledge and culture that serves the public interest. And this is something I think is very important when we've been thinking and reflecting about the past, the present and the future. So, um, you know, we've, we're about to celebrate our 20th anniversary at Creative Commons. And we've, again, while we've been doing the strategic process, we've been doing a lot of reflection. So when we think about the past 20 years, we set out to build a commons of open creative content free of most copyright restrictions. 
And with the licenses and tools, we created a simple way for creators to opt into a more permissive model of sharing. So over the past two decades, and it's remarkable that we're celebrating two decades of our existence, these legal tools have been applied to, to we think, two billion uh, works. So close to two billion works have our licenses. And that's now become a global standard. And Vanessa, you know this in terms of research. Look what Creative Commons has done in 20 years in terms of being a global standard uh, for sharing particularly in the education and research space. So what are we going to do next? And that is the thing about, we've had this great success, great achievement, but we know the world is so different from what it was 20 years ago to where we are today. And we have to acknowledge there are um, new challenges to sharing that we've got to address and new ways of sharing that we've also got to enable. And so I think that while we are thinking and reflecting on this, some of the, the, the things we are thinking about are our strengths. Clearly our strengths are within our achievements with our licenses and what we've done to enable sharing. And that is something we want to build on and reflect upon, but also improve upon. But also we have to think about what other things can we do? What is ours to do in the world of today? And so I think some of that will be creating new things that we haven't even thought about yet, but enabling us to do that in the next five years. It will be building capacity with institutions and individuals to be able to um, share and create that space to share knowledge and culture globally, because we are a global organization with a global network and community. It will be about our advocacy work as well in terms of the policy space too. And it will be more generally, how do we, um, not just with our advocates and uh, people that know about us, how are we going out to the world in the next five years to, to build on our achievements and allow more people to have access to knowledge and culture? Because we believe knowledge belongs to everyone. And if we are successful, we will achieve that in the next 20 years to come. So I hope that gives you a small cap shot, cap, capture of where we are, Vanessa. Um, I've still got to get our final strategy through our board meeting on the 6th of December. So just giving you a little flavour of where we have got to in that whole reflection process that we've had, the listening process we've had, and the ability to really think about the past 20 years, the present and the future. So, so I was curious about something. So the, the, the priority of the public interest, can you, yes. can you say a bit more about that and how important that is and how you, what, what, uh, what do you want to strive towards there um, in meeting it, public interest? I think we haven't specified that perhaps enough. And I think in the past 20 years, we have been serving the public interest, but we just haven't spelt that out. Right. And I think when we are about in the name Creative Commons, about the commons, that is the public interest. And more and more of what we are seeing is the wall gardens, the, 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 the not so sharing of uh, culture and knowledge. And we have a different model of sharing, which is in the public interest, which does protect the commons and which also allows us to improve both in society and also it's an equality aspect to this as well, an equity aspect, which I think is really important too. And we've never really specified that out in the way maybe we want to articulate it for the future. So I'm hugely excited about the way that we're thinking about the interest, the public interest that we're serving and the social good that we are advocating for. Great. Great question uh, from Joost. What do you see as, as the biggest risks? So I think some of the, the aspects that we're coming to in terms of the 20 years that we've experienced, which are very, um, when we were first, when we first started, I don't think any of us saw um, the harm that we would see in terms of aspects around, say, artificial intelligence or the aspects that we see in terms of the misinformation, disinformation that we see too. And I think that we have to, if we're going to be looking at how we um, share and thinking about that ethical sharing as well, that if we do not 
talk a little bit about some of the we talk clearly about the benefits and that's for sure but we also are in a space now after 20 years of existing we have to also look at how we can also be a solution to some of the harms and that's maturity as well in terms of the past 20 years to where we are at the moment to be able to think a little bit about that too um and i think that's um you know we want to see this and Vanessa you talked about this, this system the ecosystem I mean the open ecosystem that we want to see you know does promote ethical is ethical is inclusive is sustainable and is pro is really advocating for a pro-social sharing of knowledge and culture and you know in our strategy we want to pave the pathway how we see that happening when that's in terms of our advocacy in terms of our innovation in terms of our capacity building with both individuals and institutions hope that answers your question so shall i share our strategy i'd love to see your strategy for this because i haven't seen it yet so this is okay good so, I think so hang on it's sharing screen time again You've been very good, Vanessa, in terms of asking people for um, information and discussion. And so I thank you for that, because I, I did answer your questions when you approached me. Um, so, OK, so uh, Spark Europe has been around for 15 years um, and uh, the pillars that so we work on open access, uh, open science, which includes, of course, open access, uh, but open science, meaning um, open access to publications, but also to research data and mainly fair data. So findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable research data. Um, and we're also working on open education much more recently than our colleagues in the United States. Um, so and the real key goal is to make open the default. So you can see my screen, right? Yes. Um, so uh, our board, uh, together with me, we've developed our uh, key goals and it, this is still under consultation uh, with our members. Uh, they still have another week to go to feedback on that. Um, so, so actually echoing some of what uh, Catherine was talking about. Um, um, but let me let me first start with um, what's really key for us is to uh, support policy making in Europe. Um, so it's to um, share knowledge, to track progress on policy. So what I, I'm talking about is on an international level, so it be it UNESCO recommendations or the European Commission as a key funder in their policy or other directives um, on the European uh, Union level, um, but also in particular national uh, policy levels uh, so national uh, governments uh, with their open science policies, there are many who still don't have an open science policy in place and those who do can also strengthen them to become more fair. Um, and, um, and of course, open education policy is often part of a larger overarching education policy, but there can be a lot more work to be done. I'm also looking forward with my new community manager for open education, who we've just uh, been interviewing for this week, um, is also to explore with the Commission how one can um, up the policy on open education at the European Commission level, and to also bring some funding, a uh, much larger funding mechanism with that to enable more innovation in Europe on open education. So that's really important for us to grow policy, to, uh, to monitor it and also to really share good practices in that. Uh, institutional policy uh, making is also important. So amongst our members, we have a, an open education network of librarians because uh, which I haven't perhaps mentioned, uh, we're particularly focused on supporting the uh, academic library community that has really been so influential in open. So, um, so that's a real priority uh, policy making for us. But the, the, the second and third goal uh, really speaks to what Catherine was also talking about. So equity in the open, I think equity was started really, um, sorry, openness 
was really to create a more level playing field, to provide access, to stimulate access to knowledge for all. But actually, if you look um, in practice at open research, we're still behind paywalls. We still don't have access to the material that's being created by the public uh, purse. Um, we're locked behind uh, 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 copyright transfer agreements where we can't reuse our material, where we can't deposit it free freely and immediately uh, as yet. Um, so it's not really all in our hands and there isn't, uh, and, and although there are some models in place to unlock open through some open access business models called article processing charges, for example, this, this does not uh, enable all those who wish to publish open to be able to publish open. So there is an inequity even through open that's been created, which was of course not the original idea. So for us, it's really important that we don't just look at the article processing charge business model, that we really enable everyone to be able to publish open, particularly by focusing on licensing. So Catherine, we're really gonna be having lots of conversations about Creative Commons and how important licensing research material be it publications all sorts of different outputs so that um, it can be reused and repurposed so the reuse of research is really important for for us and that we have the control and that we don't transfer all of those rights to the publishers which is often the case um, so uh, and and fair so uh, if if we as authors also retain those rights and then distribute them and share them and the others can then reuse our material. There's more equity in the system. And we also hope to enable uh, a range of different models uh, of open education, of open access to publications so that everyone uh, can publish, as I say, op uh, openly, um, regardless of their economic situation. So with research data though, um, research data, uh, we're also going to be promoting uh, fair research data so that it's findable, it's accessible, interoperable and reusable. I think many of these words, and I, 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 shall, I shall show you some examples of how close actually all these opens are. I mean, you know, the, the interoperability is important, um, that things are findable uh, in open education as in re, uh, research data. So. We want to do more that systems and that data is really uh, easily accessible and reusable by others. So that's something we're going to be focusing on very much as well. And diversity in the publishing uh, uh, landscape for research and education. We know that there are some large commercial uh, entities co-opting open, so making money with open, but we also want very much that our community that is creating open, uh, that we try to ensure that a lot of that stays in the open space. And how can we sustain that? Um, that go goes to my fifth point, really. So how can we really sustain all of our efforts, the content, the infrastructure above all, that really that we need to either store, to discover, create uh, uh, and enable more uh, openness. Um, so how do we make sure that that is funded and sustained so that we have a really working ecosystem? And I think we, we really haven't been thinking enough about this and we really need, we, we have been working um, at Spark Europe for several years now, looking at how we can sustain open science infrastructure. Um, and I'll tell you maybe a little bit more about that later, but um, it's really important that we look after that infrastructure as a community, that it stays in the community's hands. So how can we fund that as, as a community together with uh, governments and other uh, benefactors, funders, stakeholders, yeah? fairly um, so that we're not behind another paywall um, to get access to our open content right 
And then the fourth point, which is more focused on open research rather than open education. A real sticking point for openness with open research is the reward system. And I know actually rewarding open education is also a sticking point, I think, for that sector as well. So we're going to look into both of those, but in particular open research. So open research is very much, or has been, it is moving now very much focused on the journal article and the prominence in certain um, uh, venues, uh, publications, uh, using the impact factor. But we know that there is such a wide range, a richness of research output that is actually important when recognizing the efforts of research. So that needs to be recognized. And there are funders, there are institutions, there are um, governments now recognizing other types of research and we're looking at new indicators and what we will be looking at in the next years is to share good practices on new ways of evaluating research, looking at it much more broadly and including openness in that, right? So um, it would be lovely to hear if there are any questions on our strategy for the next four years. Um, open education is really part of that. We're going to step up our game there. I think I said we're hiring uh, an open education community manager um, who's going to be really working to share knowledge in Europe, uh, in, particular in particular amongst libraries, but also bringing the knowledge from outside of libraries into libraries to see how libraries can support open education in Europe. So are there any questions on the strategy? Uh, there's a, an, an a concern uh, that uh, the data will be monopolized by big tech companies. Yes. Could you reflect on that? Uh, true. Um, I was, um, I think it was two or three years ago, I was on a panel uh, for UNESCO talking about openness and research data. And there was somebody from Microsoft there as well. But actually, Microsoft has a program to really open up a lot of their data. So there are, uh, and I think, Catherine, with your open, what was it called? What's it called? The Open COVID pledge. pledge. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are some companies who really are opening up some of their patents and their data openly. So there are some signs that there are some large companies um, doing good. Um, There is, of course, um, I think it's what's really essential is that we really uh, provide access to the publicly funded research um, as much as possible, of course, within the limits of, of, of privacy and, and national security and competition, etc. cetera. Um, that others may exploit that, that is always a risk, yes, but at the moment, there is there is so much so much uh, data uh, on USB sticks on desktops within very small research communities. This really needs to be shared for reproducibility, for uh, research integrity, um, because it's publicly funded for innovation for other. Uh, research collaborations, yes. So that really shouldn't stop. So the the idea is, oh well, if others are going to make money with my data, I I shouldn't be sharing the data. No, I really think it's a responsibility also for your community and your research to share it, not just amongst your own colleagues, but much more broadly, because we have seen that it's really generated a lot more collaboration and. Uh, uh, research across borders when sharing uh, that research data. Yeah. Sorry, sometimes I, I, I'm a little bit long in my answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, great um, answer. And another question uh, is uh, from Igor to hear more about uh, how we can strengthen the connection and the collaboration between all those different openness. Oh, yes. Okay. I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. Thank you, Igor, for that question. Um, but maybe Catherine, do you want to like go because I've just had I've just given everybody an earful. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to go into what ego egos mentioned, or shall shall I? About how we how we work together. I mean, this is a great example of why you know Vanessa and I before this 
presentation, you know, had numerous calls and was talking and that collaboration is really important, not just through having a keynote address at something, but also the fact that we do have to think more strategically of all of us who are passionate about uh, whether it's open education, open research, open science, whatever the open is, we do have to work more closely and collaboratively because the, the challenges and the other side of these, uh, these debates are very well organized. And certainly my personal journey into uh, becoming interested in the open movement, the open space was through my personal experiences of working in copyright reform as a European parliamentarian for five years. And watching the organization, the, um, the power of that organizational lobby of interests that are about private profit and not about the public interest was quite, um, a, a, well, it's why I'm here now and with you today, <laughs> because there is something about the moment that we're in. And Vanessa, you touched upon that, about how we're about inclusivity and really promoting diversity and thinking about the public good. And I, I think Matilda, you put up about thinking about the goose in the commons, absolutely. You know, how we uh, together can work more collaboratively, but also more um, collaboratively, creatively, but also uh, more structurally in some ways as an open movement and connecting um, the different interests will be important for the next 20 years for our success. Um, you know, the, the, that image of the goose in the commons and the, the famous Jamie Boyle <laughs> article where he talks about uh the uh the uh, talks about the, the the poem uh where the goose is mentioned and and how it was and it's about the enclosure you know movement from uh in talking about the second you know so there's so much um that we need to consider reflect upon but also work clearly together on and be much more intentional about how we work together to make sure that the that the open ecosystem uh is not just something we talk about it's something that exists thrives and uh, and and is built upon for all public goods about creation yes. of knowledge and culture so there's something so strong here and we need to work together on it sorry i've talked too much <laughs> no 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 I, I mean i completely agree with you and i think I think we need to work uh, on a policy level more together, but also even on operational challenges that we have. Um, so something I didn't show with my uh, with my beautiful picture here. So the one thing that's missing in this picture are all of the silos. So there are so many silos if you think about, you know, uh, with farming. And I have to say that I really think that even in the open movement, we are silos. We are not collaborating as much as we really should be. You've got the open access movement. You've got the fair data movement. You have the, and let, let me show you um, this slide. Um, so um, Sheila Coral and Stephen Pinfield, they did a, a really good um, overview of um, a typology of open and here you can see the different types of open there are and the different silos right so they kind of categorize it by open content and open process and open infrastructure so for me the bigger silos are open culture open software open access to publications then you've got fair data and then you've got open education. Why are we not talking more together like Catherine and I today? Yes. And why are we not working more strategically? Some of us are more advanced in certain areas. Uh, how can we try to prevent some of the, the problems that maybe open access has seen, um, you know, ahead of time with open education or vice versa? Yeah, that's what we really need to do. Um, so here are some examples of openness um, uh, and they're really interlinked. How they're interlinked, uh, yeah. So John Wilinski, um, I don't know whether you know him, but he's also a fantastic uh, uh, thought leader on openness. So he wrote, um, I think it was back in 2014 or even earlier, um, on open access, open science and open software. So. They all share a commitment to the unrestricted exchange of information and ideas. So an obvious reason why we need to work more together. 
where open is a public good, there's a need for more transparency, public accountability. So there are reasons, there are, you know, the, 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 the vision, we have a common vision. So it's, you know, it's a no brainer to work more together. And then also for uh, here, if you think of an institution like a university, um, you actually had back in 2008, uh, the, uh, it was somebody called Wheeler, um, the Wheeler Declaration was really talking about uh, an institution, um, a more open university and opening up most of their assets. And I think this is really uh, key for us to think about, you know, we are publicly funded, we need to really provide access to that material and it generates more innovation, more excellence, more quality by doing that. And he talks about, it includes research publications, research data, educational resources, open standards, open software. So we as, a, as institutions need to also have a joined up approach to open. Um, and I know that it makes sense for open education perhaps to be led by other departments, but do you come together with those who are leading on open access or those who are doing work with open software? I think we could do a lot more there. Um, and here, we, we are all, all members, uh, uh, UN member states have signed up to the uh, sustainable development goals, right? So how easy is it for all of our open initiatives to feed into helping our governments demonstrate how we're feeding in, how we are uh, delivering on the, the SDGs, right? So we need to join up also to be able to share that with our governments more easily that they can then easily report on how they are also meaningfully um, delivering. Uh, and then I, Sorry, Igor, I know this is a long way to the answer to your question, but I really think it's important to also show the context and how, why it's so important that we really need to talk more, right, and do more. Um, so we all know about the five R's of open with open education, but you know what's really interesting is if you look at uh, the Berlin Declaration, which was established in 2003 for open access, there they're also, and that's for publications, users to, Grant all users a free, irrevocable, worldwide rights of access to and a license to copy, use, distribute, transmit and display the work publicly and to make and distribute derivative works. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the FAIR principles for research data, which I've already talked about, um, particularly for digital assets and mach machine actionability is, you know, uh, a priority here for these principles, but it's also about making data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So all of those, they have been independently uh, developed, these, these guidelines or principles, these, you know, that we follow in our different sectors, but they are all so interconnected and we want very similar things. So all the more why we need to uh, uh, collaborate. We've also had the UNESCO recommendation on OER in 2019. Uh, and we have now a draft recommendation from UNESCO on open science. So the five areas of action for OER is build capacity, uh, develop policy, encourage equitable quality OER, nurture the creation of sustainability models and facilitate international cooperation. Now, if you look at the UNESCO recommendation on open science, indeed, it's from the same organization. So you, you, you know, hope that they have, and they have, of course, looked at the OER recommendation and that's influenced them. But there it's also uh, develop policy, invest in uh, open science infrastructures, build capacity, um, uh, there we've got, again, aligning incentives for uh, research, promote, promote innovative approaches at different stages of the scientific process and international cooperation again. So again, you know, there's a lot of alignment here, which I think is really exciting. Um, so, so Igor, back to your question, what can we really be doing? Yeah, so I think Catherine was saying, so I met Catherine when she was at the... Uh, uh, she was a, 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 um, at the European Parliament um, 
really fighting the library's case for um, in the in the copyright reform, uh, and it was you know it was a tough one, and we 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 worked with her and many others on that. The fact of the matter is that with open access, a huge amount of publishers do not allow the reuse of the publication um, of publications. Um, they may allow deposit in repositories, but there are embargoes, uh, there are version problems. Um, so we really want to promote Creative Commons licenses. So how can we uh, work with Creative Commons? Also, um, open education has the similar challenges of needing um, good legal knowledge and advice on to enable all those who create open educational resources, but also to enable those who want to publish OA. They need the same kind of advice and we pr promote Creative Commons licenses for that. That's why Creative Commons is so essential for us. And also Creative Commons is being used in the research data space, yeah. Yes. So, so that's really something that we can we can work on together, I think. Yeah, yeah. And as I, I was saying before, Vanessa, you know, clearly um, our licensing, our licenses and how um, they have been applied and used in 2 billion, almost 2 billion works, use CC licenses is, is a great achievement. And we need to build on that, advocate for that clearly, but and, and tell the story about the impact that this has for so many individuals, institutions, and for us as a society as a whole, the fact that shared knowledge and culture can, can improve our well-being. And that links to some things you said about the sustainable development goals as well, how that interlinks in it. But often the work that we do, you know, I, I think a great challenge in coming into Creative Commons is making, you know, the invisible visible, because often our licenses for Creative Commons are, 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 are used, maybe sometimes taken for granted and, and are not maybe as obvious. Um, but yeah, it's the infrastructure, some call it the plumbing that allows things to happen. And if it wasn't there, um, our world would be poorer for it. Um, yes. So there, there's, uh, you know, something that's come up in the chat, Vanessa, that maybe you haven't, you know, a theme maybe is that when we're thinking about open, in its broadest sense for the past 20 years. And really it has been in the past 20 years we've seen our debates about open being partly because of technology, partly because of, of where we want to see that, that, that ability to share knowledge. But what's the next 20 years going to be like? And how are we going to, 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 to work together to see the world we want to see in the next, with all the challenges that we have, and I think some of the things that you've um, you've highlighted in in your your presentation um, are are well said and 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 well put. Um, but how do we how are we going to? Some people saying get out of these silos and work together. Yes. And I think that's something that we're that we'll certainly be talking more about. <laughs> yes, I mean really and. So what's really key for me is also to really collaborate more with organizations like ourselves. And, you know, there are several ways how we can work more together. Who there we just don't have the time, do we really? Uh, let me just jump to some things. Um, There's a question um, about uh, open is not cheap. So yeah. could you reflect on the funding part? So some of that, I mean, you know, I think that that's that's in terms of some aspects. In other aspects, you could say that that open during the COVID crisis, when we've been delivering yes. education online, delivering university, you know, all of this, that it, it's absolutely essential. Um, something that was, you know, related to me about just sometimes the practicalities when we're doing webinars and doing <laughs> events and summits is for you know, when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion, how we must make sure that, you know, basic internet access for many people who want to maybe access some of the events that we do 
it's not cheap and not accessible and um and particularly if we want to engage uh, globally we need to think about sometimes just small things make a difference and we can um do that together but yes you're right that um there's a leadership mindset investment but it's the right thing to do for the public interest you know you could say the same arguments that you know uh, good public health services are not cheap but they're essential for our public good and public health and the common interest so um i yes. think that as we move to the next 20 years of open i think some of the issues around um leadership culture um aspects around what that means for the common good and the public interest are going to be key questions uh, and 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 uh, key key pieces of the of of those that advocate for open that have to be said heard and uh, and put across well yes well just coming back to that question on uh, open isn't cheap yeah so if you think about covid the si the situation that we're in with covid oh that's just jumped on me um so if if our material would have been open from the from the first off our essential publications and that there was a, a a system in place where researchers were immediately sharing their research of course it has to be peer reviewed uh where the research data is also has a plate that um systematically research data is being shared publications are shared that we have an open education system where open educational resources are you know very widespread would we really be in the situation that we have been in over the last month scrambling uh, dependent on the generosity of some publishers to open up their material temporarily yes certain material no i really think it's important that we have to invest in this now because it's going to be much more cost effective in the future so for other crises that we have to face we need to have a strong base of knowledge and information that we can depend upon and not that we depend on um things that are behind paywalls and that we our knowledge is our knowledge and that if we need access to it that we have immediate access how urgent it was to have access to uh the the covid material and there has there are some great archives that were already developed by the open access community which the covid community has been using but there could be a lot more and i think with open education resources yeah because it's still moving you know uh we were so focused on providing access to the facilities rather than the content because the content isn't yet there and you know what a pity but we need to think about how can we up our game there yeah um yeah. i so, think that, i think that's really true vanessa i think that's a really um an open education has been so um, so important in, in 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 at this moment you know it, it, if there's ever a time to advocate for open education resources and open access the irony has been that covid has actually allowed us to have more conversations about this than was previously because we need to enable and the you know one of the things we haven't touched upon at all is how how we inspire new generations well you know um i think at the moment the the, the, the you know young people are passionate about social justice and passionate about climate and have been caught up often at this moment in education by having to have online learning as the only option particularly in the us where you know um just one of my my my, my um, one of my colleagues at creative comms saying you know they've been told i think in california that they will know they'll still be online um learning and that's huge challenges to be able to have good materials and up to date education offer that that is uh, is meeting the needs of both the curriculum but also of the, of the children that are having to go through this experience of not being with their peers and uh, and that's hugely challenging for both teachers and educators and and for educate for for pupils too as the daughter of two teachers I'm passionate about open education and about uh, and about um uh, uh, and and what that looks like and and, uh, and and I think it just is so important and that's why the conference that we're speaking at just now and the summit that we're doing yes. is so important um, well it is you know and these these conferences and these networks so 
how can we work more together and bring them together? It's really, firstly, we need to have our communities of practice where we share uh, and also places where we share material. This is a really lovely example, Foster Open Science, where there's a mass of fantastic resources on open science. So don't reinvent the wheel. We, we need to be doing this for more for open education, but that's a lovely example. But you know, these networks, for research data, there's the RDA network. They have 36 working groups, 66 interest groups worldwide talking about building bridges to research data. So we've got our network for open education librarians. We've got the open air nodes, which is focused on open access and open science in different countries. They're organized. Uh, there's an op open access books network. So, and how can we bring those networks together and sh uh, to come and share experiences because I guarantee you they are talking about discovery, they're talking about uh, uh, legal challenges, they're talking about uh, policy development, advocating for open, the difficulties in, in all of that, that we are all, I know that some of our stakeholders are different with open education and open research, but there are enough common areas where we can work together. But so work in your communities of practice but bring the, some of those together and I have some ideas of how we can do that next year uh, sometimes I have too many ideas so but you know I think this one is really an important one and it was inspiring to have this session um, and I think a last thing which is really important for me to just very very briefly touch on is we we can also learn a lot about how we're looking at funding open infrastructure uh, we must look at this in the open education community and in the open research community. Yeah, so I was talking about that earlier on about um, we need to really have a thriving open infrastructure that supports all of our work and um, that we care for it and fund it. So one of the things that Spark Europe has been doing and leading on is uh, it's called SCOS.org and that's community funding for open science infrastructure. Sorry about that. Oh, what's happened there? Help. Yes. Uh, so the community's helped raise more than 3 million euros for several essential infrastructures. So we need to think about, we need to be creative about different business models for our textbooks, for our OERs, but also the infrastructure, the discovery systems, the storage systems, um, um, other schemas that we depend upon. So um, I think that's something that we can really work on together. And I know that Paul, Stacy, and I, we're really keen to join forces to share our experiences on that and to move things forward as well. And that also feeds into the UNESCO uh, recommendation. So, um, so those are some examples of how we can work together. Um, I'm really excited about those uh, opportunities. And I'm really looking forward to also working more with Creative Commons, also for them to support the open research community and really get more publishers and authors to use CC licenses, yeah? I mean, that's an uphill struggle still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been talking too much, haven't I, Catherine? No, I'm just looking at the question. What is your view, uh, published before or only after a view? And there's other things about how we work. Are we stronger distributed? Um, or, you know, because individuals, I think the, the point is, I think we're stronger distributed individuals burn out and such a model isn't sustainable or kind to individuals. Uh, so there's a lot of chat going on. So it's great, great. to have that interaction. So, um, uh, but I think that, that, that you know, we, there's so much still to do, right? You know, there's yes. so much. Um, and in doing this, the, 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 the the strategy planning at Creative Commons over the past three months, the, the striking thing is that all of these different opens, we have to find the elements that we have in common to collaborate, to make impact and create impact. And, you know, some people talk about the big open, but, but I think there's, there's, there's definitely some piece of work of connection, collaboration to, to achieve what we want to achieve, even when we have this diversity within, um, and that's the great, 
that's the great thing about that creativity that that has in that diversity because of that diversity of thought creates the the, the new knowledge the the new way of thinking the, the 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 solutions for the pressing problems that we're going to face in the next 20 years and we know a lot of that is around uh, climate and we we see that at the moment uh, one of my 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 colleagues is i think in iowa today it was or yesterday it was 17 degrees 18 degrees and this is the what the 20th of november in iowa at 20 degrees you know it's Gosh. it's it you know the climate crisis that we're in as well as the the the, the, the other challenges that we face are things that we are all touched by um and can think about how we work together on and open is part of the solution to some of the, the, the those pressing problems we haven't even considered. But, you know, we've thought a lot about with the open COVID pledge about thinking about, you know, we could have an open climate pledge where we share resources and think about how uh, that public resource and public good. Um, but uh, yeah, so much to do. And that's great yes. to be friends today to think about ways that we can work together to solve those problems. Yeah, and you know, actually thinking about COVID, I think COVID is really an opportunity where there's really an urgency for more openness and there is uh, there are some great opportunities for us to work more together. Um, you know, uh, so um, much as it's, it's brought us, you know, terrible, really terrible times and impacted us on us in, in many different ways, I think um, going forward, working more together to help solve some of these you know really urgent problems together like you say climate change or covid or other things yeah. Uh, yeah. through the opens and we need to de demonstrate that more effectively also to our governments to our funders to our institutions about you know what we what what we are doing really matters and um so um yeah it's been really lovely to share some of these thoughts today and have a, have a, have a conversation publicly. <laughs> uh, I didn't really think about how many uh, uh, were watching, but it, it's been really nice to, to, to chat and um, to uh, spare some thoughts on this. And I love when um, Clara has put a comment on saying, I'm told my 13 year old yesterday when I, you know, how to explain to properly attribute below the photograph taken from, from Wikimedia Commons and things. So it's lovely to see people interacting on the chat saying how oh, they're nice. applying CC. And, <laughs> and um, I'm like, I've got a bit of a job of work to do with my 15 year old and nine year old. So I'll be on it after this call. Uh, <laughs> I put some links, by the way, on the our page, uh, there are some links if you want to kind of go and look at some of the references I've used. So uh, go ahead, do but do get in touch. And if you disagree with anything that I said, um, I would love to continue discussing. So anybody, uh, my email is this. I shared the link to, oh, the, to your okay. session, session on the Connect platform. Well, so fine. please invite uh, invite everyone to, to respond there. Thank uh, you. We're uh, at the end of the session. So uh, a big applause for you. It was a great and very interesting session. Uh, and and, and uh, very interactive with a lot of uh, responses from the, from the participants. So uh, really, uh, thank you very much. Uh, could you stop the recording, Bea? Thank you.